once again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for the fifth in our 2021 series of lockdown Q&As. Well, it's been a very busy day for most of us, scrambling to reserve our seats for the New Zealand test. And we're all now looking forward to being back at Lords very soon. So what better way to conclude the day by welcoming a very special guest tonight, the captain of England from 2000 until her retirement from international cricket in 2006, the managing director of women's cricket for the ECB, and shortly to become the next president of MCC, Claire Connor, CBE. In a minute, John Fingleton will provide a proper introduction to our guest, but in the meantime, may I please, as usual, just remind all of you to make sure your microphones are kept muted unless you're asking a question. Our first questions this evening come from Danny Flowers, Derek Wheeler and John Wilson. So would you all please be ready when Fingers concludes his opening remarks? We may have time for a couple of additional questions. So if you would like to ask anything, please use the Zoom chat facility and address your questions to me or Paul Graeber or Stuart Lewis. Fingers. Thank you very much, James, and good evening, everyone. And what a treat and what a thrill to be able to introduce a very dear friend of mine. We were just trying to work out of about 15 or 20 years standing because I was honored to become a fellow of Brighton College oh, but in the early part of the millennium. And uh, Claire had left, finally had left for a little while to go to Manchester University and then came back as a teacher there and taught English and was also, I think, head of marketing. But she had set a trend because she was really a, a, a trendsetter because not only did she play cricket for Brighton College first, 11 boys, but so late and, and England, but so did Holly Colvin, Sarah Taylor, Laura Marsh, and Freya Davis, I think, is one of the more recent ones. And it is a remarkable record. And Claire has been the first at so many things, including uh, what I just said, and also to play in an MCC men's match at Lords, which unfortunately was rained off. I was there. It was very sad. It was rained off halfway through. She also is one of the most gonged people I know, because she picked up an MBE in 2004, an OBE in 2006, a CBE in 2018. So she's almost got a full house. I think there's only one left, and I wonder how long that will be. Anyway, I was going to say more, but I tonight we um, I have a message to read out from a very old friend of Claire's, Malcolm Reed, who was I think her captain uh, at um, at uh, Preston Nomads, who sadly can't be with us tonight, but is going to be watching this on the recording. But he's asked me to say the following: back in the late eighties and early nineties. I was involved with Preston Nomads Cricket Club, where my sons played youth cricket, winning several trophies. I became Colts manager and carried on after they had graduated to senior cricket because it was enjoyable to see the youthful enthusiasm generated by the club. The club hosted the famous Bunbury Festival at its walking ground for 15-year-olds who went on to play for England. It was around this time of the year when we were seeking potential new young members. I organized a match at Preston Park in Brighton for under 12s. I knew nothing about them, but they were not short of promoting themselves. I can captain, I can bat, I can bowl, I can keep wicket, the boys all shouted. There was a quiet, solitary girl. I pointed to her and declared she would be captain. The noise stopped abruptly. I was umpiring, the match started with the boys burning at each end. After about six overs, the new captain asked me if she could have a bowl. I told her that she was captain, it was up to her. I wondered what was going to happen. Left arm, short run, in she came. Wow. Spot Thank on. You. Spot on a length and turned a mile. She went on to Captain Preston Nomads and eventually England. I am a member of MCC, but I must have missed her shouting, I can be president. Well done, Claire. I hope you have a great year. I can't think of a better way to introduce the lovely and wonderful and brilliant Claire Colvin. Claire Connor. <laughs> Thanks, Fingers. Thank Thanks, you. Fingers. Okay, well, we've, our first two questions come from Derek Wheeler and Danny Flowers. I'm going to ask Danny to go first, and then followed by Derek, and then Claire can answer you both because <coughs> you have related questions. Danny, right. you first. Right, Claire. What, what I'd like to ask is what 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 is your most important thing you're going to do this in your year of office? And Derek. Yeah, Claire. First of all, congratulations. Um, in your article on Friday's Telegraph, you said, quote, it's a real chance to recognize the progress we have made in a relatively short space of time, 
but also to explore what challenges and barriers we have to overcome. The MCC as a club has a long way to go and a lot to do, but acknowledging that it is part of the humility of everything. The centres still do exist, so hopefully we can influence that change. What do you think, uh, what do you see as your main challenge or issues you would uh, like to address as the MCC president? Uh, okay, thank, thanks, Derek. And uh, who was it for the first one? Danny, was it? Danny. Yeah, th thanks for your questions. Um, and, and it's really good to be here. Thanks, Fingers and James, for the introductions. Um, look, I think they're quite, um, they're quite similar questions, aren't they? So probably why James has, has bunched them together. Um, you know, I think my, my appointment as um, the first female president of the MCC following, you know, hot on the heels of the, of Kumar being the first overseas president of the MCC, I think, and I hope, um, really spells um, and reflects um, the MCC wanting to be more, uh, more, more modern, um, more inclusive, um, more representative of um, everybody who loves this great game. Um, and so, you know, that, that part of the honor for me, I think, is, is, is having the opportunity to dovetail my ECB role as Managing Director of Women's Cricket, where I'm accountable for the growth strategy of, of the women's game in this country, to dovetail that role with my time, you know, this very sacred and, and precious uh, year that I've got ahead of me. You know, I feel like it's kind of got underway already um, with various uh, various lovely functions and events and lots of meetings. Um, so I've had a nice build, build up to it starting in October. Um, there's no doubt that my, my, my focus and my, my main passions and loyalties and, and, and interest in the game are going to be around diversity and um, particularly what the MCC Foundation is doing um, for girls um, with a very a very keen focus on girls cricket, both in the UK and abroad. Um, you know, we have huge challenges still, I think, and barriers to overcome as a sport, you know, because sport represents society. Um, we've just come off, off the back of a four day social media blackout across uh, professional football, professional cricket and other sports um, with those sports standing together against discrimination whether that be racial or gender. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, we're, we're in 2021 and, and those actions are still needing to be taken. So, you know, there is a long way to go, I think, before um, cricket generally and with MCC in this amazing position at the, the pinnacle, you know, such a respected institution, such a respected club around the world. What the MCC says really matters and what the MCC talks about and signals really matters. And so I hope um, that in my year, I can play a part in helping the club in whatever way to modernize and to make everybody feel included in the game. It's very difficult with our long, as we know, with our long, um, uh, very drawn out uh, waiting list for full membership. But there are other things that we can do. And obviously, I could, I, you know, I, I've got a few early ideas, but I, I won't go into detail here. But there are other ways in which we can signal our intent as a club to be more welcoming, um, to, um, to, 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 to move slightly quicker than perhaps it has in the past. Um, I know that Guy Lavender is, you know, I've had many conversations with Guy about this, and he is... Um, wanting to you know, completely take the, the MCC in that direction. And so hopefully we can work together. And as I say, I can play, play some part in that. Um, I think we've, we've, we've done a lot already, um, uh, but there's, a, there's certainly a long way to go. Um, and so the opportunity to be in this position is a huge honor. Um, and I really do hope that I can uh, use my, my ECB day job as well um, to good effect. Um, and and help take the MCC forward into a really exciting and inclusive future. Thank, thank you. you, Claire, and thank you, Derek and Danny. Well, you mentioned uh, your ECB day job. I think John Wilson, who's going to ask the next question, has a related question for you. John. 
Uh, Claire, good evening, and thanks for taking the time to to um, meet and talk with us uh, this evening. Uh, I, I had been going to ask you some questions about governance uh, and also the committee's rigging of the ballot, uh, the AGM, but I, I, I understand I'm just steer clear of those topics. So, yeah, my question relates to the fact that you will be wearing an ECB hat and an MCC hat. So I'm curious as to how you will manage the conflicts of interest that could arise. So, for example, many members feel that the county game has been marginalised by the introduction of the 100, uh, or equally the desire to have two tests at Lords, uh, and on your ECB side, the prominence of women, women's cricket uh, in the fixture list. Um, so how will you manage those conflicts of interest? And when addressing different audiences, how will you clearly distinguish which hat you are wearing when presenting opinions to an audience, mindful they could easily be attributed to the wrong hat? Yeah, John, it's a, it's a brilliant question. It's one that uh, I've, I'm giving, trying to give lots of early thought to. Um, one that I've already spent a little bit of time chatting to Tom Harrison, my boss at the ECB, about. Um, because the last thing he wants and the ECB board want is for me to feel in any way silenced or muffled um, on anything, you know, as you say, where that potential conflict might arise or where, you know, the, the, there's a very fine line between which hat I should be wearing. Um, so I think it's a really good question. It actually um, came, to, came to pass on Friday morning. I was at Lord's last Friday to do some media for the Captain Tom 100 um, challenge launch, which was a one completely wonderful few hours. The, the ground looked amazing and the, it, it couldn't have looked more beautiful. And, um, and this exact thing happened. I was doing a live radio, uh, late radio interview with um, Nikki Campbell and Claire McDonnell on Five Live. And the first two questions were very sort of gentle about the Captain Tom 100 and how fantastic it was that they were there, the family were there ringing the bell at Lords and Captain Tom's love of cricket and what MCC stands for and what the Captain Tom Foundation stands for. So that was all very lovely. And then the next two questions were as follows. Claire, whilst we've got you, do you think the IPL should be carrying on? And then the next question was, and then Claire, just to wrap up, what are your views on, you know, the social media blackout this weekend and, and the prevalence of racism in cricket? So it was a really, um, it really brought to life for me how easy it's going to be for um, media or, or anybody to ask me the, some of the kind of the wider reaching cricket issues as a, as a senior administrator at ECB whilst wearing my MCC hat. Um, so, look, I think it's a really good question. It's something I'm going to have to be um, careful of, I suppose, without being, um, you know, I, without being, uh, feeling like I'm, like I'm being sort of, like I am being, I am muffled with either hat on. Um, and I'm going to have to be diplomatic and, but also I think work out where the common ground is. So what are the things that the MCC believes in um, along with the ECB and let's make sure that by having two hats that I'm privileged to have that I can uh, that I can really work hard for those kind of common interests um, and shared objectives for the game whilst being I suppose um, slightly careful um, about getting into sort of um, muddy waters on, on either side. Um, so I think you know there haven't been probably many MCC presidents with that conflict certainly with a full-time role, it's, well, probably none. Um, I think actually Matthew Fleming said to me when I was um, last year, I think he said that he and I have been the only, will be the only two MCC presidents with full-time jobs. That's not to kind of denigrate or say that Kumar or anyone else hasn't got full-time work, um, far from it. But I think, you know, M Matthew was talking about that in terms of the time commitment and, and getting that balance right. But I think probably, you know, Matthew at the time, I think, was Matthew maybe on the ECB board when he was MCC president? Maybe he'd just come off the MCC, the ECB board. Um, so maybe he didn't have that conflict. So I think it's probably quite unique, um, John. Um, and so I'm just going to have to, I suppose, tread carefully, but make sure that, you know, where I've got an opinion, I feel I can get it across. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, John. Thank you, Claire. Claire, uh, you, you mentioned uh, your interview at Five Live and the IPL suspension. Uh, you probably know, and I think most members will know, that it was actually suspended 
four hours ago it was announced because there have been cases amongst the players. Do you, do you have any comments on that? Was it the right decision? Should it have been made sooner? Oh, look, it was definitely the right decision um, when it was taken today. Um, you know, as soon as you've got positive cases, I think across four teams, I think that Delhi and Sun, uh, Sunrisers Hyderabad um, had cases over the last 24 hours. So that meant that there were four teams with positive cases and the COVID protocols therefore mean that everybody in that bubble has to isolate. And therefore, actually, there wasn't a decision to be made in the end because, you know, the cricket couldn't be played. The games, you know, you can't keep indefinitely postponing games until uh, teams have come out of isolation once you've got cases. So I think probably today, whilst, um, you know, whilst disappointing for the tournament, it was probably a straightforward call. Um, I was asked the question, um, James, on, on, as, as I said, on Friday, and, and I, I think it's very difficult for us to judge. Um, clearly, the, um, the pandemic over there is, is brutal and it's ravaging India, um, you know, more violently probably than anywhere else um, now, probably worse than Brazil and, and, and America. Um, but, you know, you, you, you think back to, to our summer last year, you know, we were able to put cricket on, albeit it wasn't ravaging this country so violently, but we still were able to put cricket on in a safe and secure way um, against the West Indies and Pakistan men and then West Indies women um, and Australia men's white ball cricket. So I, I think it's, um, it's such a difficult one. I don't think we can judge from here. Um, what I did say on Friday was that having been to India many, many times as a cricketer and for work, you know, with ICC and in my, in my job, you know, the joy that cricket brings to the people of India is, is very hard to, to kind of, um, to, to kind of to, to express. And, and therefore for that competition to be going on, you know, when people are shut inside, trying to keep safe, trying to keep their families safe, to have some cricket to watch in the evenings, um, probably did bring them some escapism and some distraction from the the grim reality of kind of what was what was going on around them. So I don't think it's for us to judge whether they they've postponed it too late. Um, uh, I think you know you can see all sides of the argument, and I think whilst they were keeping everybody safe, um, and whilst they weren't taking any resource away from um, the kind of the desperate need of the Indian people. Um, then there probably was absolutely nothing wrong with it carrying on. Um, but I think clearly today, you know, it, it, it has reached that tipping point where it couldn't continue. Sure. Thank you. Well, look, our next question was going to come from Tom Simpson, but I understand, Paul, he's not able to be present. So one of my two co-hosts, Paul Graeber, will ask the question on Tom's behalf. Paul. Thank you, James. This is Tom's question. What was it like growing up as a female cricketer at a time when fewer women were playing the game? In particular, what are your memories of playing cricket at Manchester University? I was captain at the time and look back with regret that the rules did not allow you to play in the team for the BUSA competition. I hope and expect there is now a women's team. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I think I remember Tom um, at Manchester University um, so maybe he'll watch this back. Um, if you do, Tom, hi, I hope you're doing well. Um, yeah, look, I trained with the men's team. I trained uh, in, uh, in my first, certainly in my first year or two, I trained with the men's team indoors. But as, as Tom says in his question, I wasn't allowed to play in the men's team um, in the BUSA, the British University's competition, um, even though I had obviously been playing a high level of all, all men's or all boys cricket through um, playing for Brighton College first 11 as, as, the, only, as the only female. So that was disappointing um, at Manchester University. However, the, the timing, um, you know, I, when I started at Manchester University to read English, I, it, was all, it, it was the same time that I started playing for England women. So actually, you know, Manchester for me was just about trying, you know, getting my degree and attending as many lectures and tutorials as I could, and then doing all of my training um, with England women outside of that. Um, I missed eight weeks of my first term at um, Manchester University to go to India, which was my first big, big tour with England. Um, 
So yes, look, on the one hand, it was disappointing that I was allowed to train with the, the men, not the boys, with the men at Manchester, uh, but I wasn't allowed to play, play in the team. I think I would have been somewhere there or thereabouts um, in terms of standard. Um, maybe I wouldn't have got into the to the main Manchester first eleven. It was a good standard, really good standard. So it was disappointing, but I, I you know, I had other, I had, a, I by then um, I was playing for England women, and that was my my focus. And I was getting good training and good support, albeit as an amateur, um, through the England women setup. Um, but the first part of his question, I think, was what was it like being the only female in in a in a very kind of male dominated sport and. I, I am asked that question on every, every interview, pretty much. And, and, and I don't get tired of the answer, which was, I think, you know, whilst the opportunities are incredible now, or way better for women and girls to play women's and girls cricket, my own experiences, you know, as a, as a, as a girl and a young woman playing in boys teams were, were amazing. Um, I, didn't, I didn't feel odd. I was always, I always felt welcome. Um, I suppose it helped that I was, you know, good enough on merit to be in that environment, in those environments. Um, and I think having the kind of unconditional support of my family, my coaches, my, my first 11 coach at Brighton was the former Sussex bowler, John Spencer. Um, and I, he coached me for two or three years. And I was so well looked after, you know, I was given amazing coaching. Similarly, you know, as, as per Malcolm Reed's introduction through fingers at the beginning there, um, my experiences at Preston Nomads Cricket Club, playing in boys teams from the age of nine, uh, nine or 10. Um, uh, I was always made to feel very welcome and they gave me a great grounding in the game. Um, but the great thing now is that, you know, I was, a, I was an oddball, that's for sure. And I was, I was, um, I succeeded, if you like, in spite of the sport. So I succeeded in spite of the fact that there were no real opportunities for women and girls in my area. Um, and, and now, thankfully, that's changed and women and girls can find um, teams, you know, in clubs or schools or whatever for them so that they don't have to if they don't want to play in, in boys or men's teams. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, Tom Simpson, who, as you say, we hope will be watching this on the recording. Next question, then, from Peter Richardson. Peter. Good evening. Good evening, Claire. And thank you very much, indeed, for giving up your time and uh, um, all the best on your uh, on your appointment and uh, all the best for next year. Uh, my question. <laughs> my question is that the Women's World Cup final in 2017 was up there with the, most, with the most memorable and best sporting occasions I've ever witnessed live. Essex's win over Surrey in the Benson Hedges final in 79, our first trophy. West Ham's cup final victory in 1980 over Arsenal. Japan's World Cup victory over South Africa in the 2050 Rugby World Cup. And the Men's Cricket World Cup final in, in 2019 being the others. Um, I took, uh, sorry John, uh, sorry. <laughs> I took um, uh, 12 guests to the women's final. We didn't know the two teams, but I was managed to get 12 tickets. Most had never been to a cricket match, let alone to Lords before. They were mesmerised by, you know, by the atmosphere and how the game panned out. What are your memories of that game? And do you think we have built on the legacy and feel-good factor from that game and tournament, domestically and internationally? If we have, how? And if not, why not? <laughs> Sorry, okay, that's no, question. that's fine. Thanks, Peter. I won't ask you to actually, I won't put you on the spot and ask you to actually <laughs> rank it. I won't ask you to put the Women's World Cup final in pole position, but I'm sure you would. Um, so, look, yes, I mean, it was the most magical day. Um, the the build-up, you know, I, this is the end of a, the World Cup in this country in 2017. Um, we'd sold out Lords even before we knew England were in the final which I think says a lot about the appetite in this country for major events. Um, and it says a lot now about the appetite in this country for women's, women's sport. So, so it was amazing to know that we'd sold Lords out before we'd even won our semi-final. Um, it was a completely incredible, magical day for me personally. Um, I, I was very emotional for kind of from start to finish. Um, I headed over from, from my hotel very early in the morning to do some 
uh, some interviews on the nursery ground before anyone had arrived. So I watched the ground, you know, go from being completely ghostly silent at seven in the morning um, with, but just with this sort of hubbub of, of activity starting to build um, as, as the, you know, all the, the stewards and the ground staff and everybody got ready for the day. It was just wonderful. Um, the, the game, I mean, the, the other really amazing thing about that, uh, the game just before it started was, was obviously we'd lost Rachel Hayho Flint earlier that year. So seeing her on the big screen was very moving. Mm -hmm. um, and also Eileen Ash, who is 107, I think, she is the world's, she is the world's oldest international cricketer, male or female. Um, so she came to Lords that day, aged 103, I think, um, to ring the bell. Um, and that whole experience, I'd, I'd taken Heather Knight, the England women's captain, to meet Eileen in Norwich about six months beforehand. So that was all completely wonderful um, to have Eileen there on the day. Um, Eileen, had, Eileen played only a handful of games for England either side of the war. She was also a spy um, and uh, has had an, an amazing life. So look, that, that, was, that was also, that made it even more special to have someone of that age, that generation of the women's game um, at Lords that day. Um, and then I suppose, you know, look, I could talk about this for ages, so I, I'll, I'll just, you know, what was lovely about it, um, Peter, was that I watched most of the game from various places, a bit in the pavilion, uh, a bit in the media centre, a bit up in some of the boxes. I had to get around to see quite a lot of people um, in my ECB role. Um, I made sure that I spent uh, 20 minutes uh, with our players' families as well. We had a box for our players' families and I wanted to see them. But I watched the last 10 overs with my dad and my brother. Um, and yeah, and uh, as those of you who know, you know how that game swung, that was literally, a, li literally at the moment that it started to swing. Um, that last that last sort of 20 minutes or so, half an hour. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of emotion. It was completely wonderful. I, if I'm honest, I didn't, you know, having worked with the England women's team for, you know, for, for the previous seven years. Um, and then in the build up to that World Cup, I wasn't sure with a new captain after Charlotte Edwards finishing and Heather in charge and where we were with a bit of player retirement, I wasn't sure we were ready to win that World Cup. Um, so I certainly didn't expect it. Um, so as, as you say, it was mesmerizing, I think was the word you used. Um, and to see the ground full, full of a new audience, you know, a very different Lord's audience, lots of uh, families, very, very young audience, lots of children, lots of women, um, was, was, was wonderful. Um, and then the second part of your question, um, Peter was around whether we've capitalized on it. Um, it's a really hard one to answer. I, I, I mean, what I can say since then is that we, we then had a year and a half after that World Cup win, we had a strategy signed off by the ECB board to invest 50 million pounds into the women's game, um, grassroots through to elite um, between 2020 and 2024. So we're in the middle of that investment period now. And that was a significant increase in anything we'd invested before. So we've also, you know, that's a lot of money that we're now investing on the back of that World Cup win. We've got three times the number of fully full-time professional players that we had um, then. Um, we've got a new domestic structure, fully professional. Um, there will be mixed views, I know, I'm sure, within, within everyone listening here on The 100, but that's coming in this summer. And that's, that's set to be a, a big platform for the women's game in terms of profile and visibility. And we've seen growth in the grassroots. So we've seen, um, we've seen a 20% increase since the World Cup win in the number of women's and girls club sections that have, um, that have expanded since that win. So, you know, I, I, I think we've, you know, I think we've done some things really well. I think, it, I suppose my completely honest answer would be, it would be, it would have been good to have had that strategy written, ready to launch immediately after the winning the World Cup. But as it was, we had about 18 months where we had still quite a little bit of that strategy to write. 
Um, but yeah, overall, fairly pleased. Um, and uh, certainly that day uh, will live long in the memory. Thank Thanks you very much indeed, Claire. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Well, we've got a, um, a related question now from Simon Doff. Simon. Yes, um, good evening, Claire. Um, like Peter, I was um, a spectator at the World Cup final, the Women's World Cup final, and thoroughly enjoyed the day. Um, and as you're probably aware, many people prefer women's tennis to watching men's tennis. What, what do you think the strengths are from a spectator's point of view of women's cricket? Uh, and how would you market women's cricket? Not necessarily to a new, new audience, but to members of the MCC and, and the male cricket viewing public worldwide? What, what, what are the strengths of the game, do you think? Um, thanks, Simon. I think, I think it's a really interesting question because um, I think in general, this kind of comparison between men's and women's cricket doesn't, it doesn't really take us forward. Mm. So I would say that, and, and you referred to women's tennis there. And what you'll rarely, if ever, hear is that um, Serena Williams isn't as good as Federer or as Nadal. I mean, actually, Serena Williams has won three more Grand Slams than, than they have. So, um, you know, but what, and, and that's how I, you know, on her, on merit, she is, you know, one of the game's greatest tennis players. And you don't really hear of um, the comparison um, in, in terms of ability or talent or success or whatever. Similarly, you never hear that um, of, you know, that Flojo, who, you know, whose world record in the 100 metres, I think, is about a, a, a second slower than Usain Bolt. You never hear that she is, she is less good. They are equally amazing and, um, uh, you know, um, amazing sports men and women in their own right. And I think the problem sometimes, the, not sometimes, the, one of the problems with cricket and the other dual gender sports like let's say football and rugby is that they, because of their histories and their male prevalence, they are unhelpfully compared to each other. So men's and women's cricket are compared to each other and men's and women's football are compared. And often amongst men, those comparisons are, they don't, you know, women, the women's version doesn't come out very favorably. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, it's, tr it's tricky. And I think it's about trying to, as you use the word, market it in its own right. So, you know, that World Cup final um, win in 2017, which you were at, was no less good um, than the men's equivalent in 2019. I mean, let's be honest, how can any game of cricket reach the drama of ever again of that 2019 men's win? Um, but, you know, two incredible wins by two brilliant England teams. And I suppose it's about trying to encourage um, men, if you, as you mentioned, aside from the new audience of women and girls who, you know, who we shouldn't need to be convincing. Um, it's, it's about, I think, trying to, to show them um, the women's game in, in, in all its glory. And that does require broadcast commitments. It does require visibility. Um, and, and that fortunately is growing and growing all the time. Um, this summer um, through England women's matches and the 100, we'll have over 50 games of women's cricket live either on the BBC or live on Sky and all of them live on Sky's YouTube channel, which is obviously free to, free to access. So I think it's about getting it out there. It's about showing the world um, what it is uh, for those that haven't seen it um, and giving it its, own, giving it its own space and its own coverage. Um, and that's, you know, that's where the 100 will be interesting because it will be seen alongside the men's the men's game, you know, this idea of one club, two teams, London spirit men, London spirit women, one captain by Owen Morgan, one captain by Heather Knight. Um, but what you hope from that is that this new audience and the new generation will see Heather Knight and Owen Morgan on, a, on, a, on, an, equal, on an equal billing. 
Um, yeah. So I think it's a great yeah. question. Can, um, Claire, can I come back to just one, cool. one thing that I really liked was in the men's game where people are, are fitter and stronger than ever. Um, that you strength plays a great part. What was nice about the women's game, and particularly the batting, is because women didn't have the strength, they had to use timing and using the pace of the ball. And it was very nice to see batting where, where timing rather than strength. Yeah, I, I think that's, that is, you're right. Yeah, the, the, many people say that the, the, the female players, you know, their, their techniques, their timing, their touch, and now the fact that they are becoming more powerful is giving them a very rounded game. Um, you know, you add in then all the kind of innovative shots and the being able to play all around the all around, you know, that 100, 360 degree game. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's I, you know, I, I, I hope I suppose I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think it has got everything. You know, it's got you know, we've got some some bowlers who are getting quicker and quicker. You know, we'll never reach the, the, the speeds of the of the men's game. But I don't think that matters. Um, and, and as you say, we've got some, some batters who, who play all around, all around the wicket and have got beautiful timing and skill and elegance. So mm. hopefully there's something in it for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, next question then from Noel Kearns. Noel. Uh, thank you, James. Good evening, Claire. Hi, Noel. First of all, may I offer my thoughts and congratulations for, for your presidency, I'm sure. Dame Rachel up there would have been clapping clapping in support. So well Thank done. You. I live in Godmanchester. Um, Lottie was born in Godmanchester. I'm gonna I'm gonna I've gonna bring two prongs together in my question. So first of all, of course, Lottie played just well, you're both the same generation, basically. And uh, Lottie joined England the year after you started playing according to what my research says now um you both had you know had thoughts and careers um you had to make some lifestyle choices and sacrifices to play for england in those in those years <laughs> lottie was walk, working away at hunts county bats trying to scratch a living in around about 2007 she asked me if i could help to see if i could get a, a car sponsored for her because the demands were getting more, no money. Uh, she couldn't work at Hunts County Bass because the, the demand for cricket were growing and she couldn't even afford to buy herself a car. Well, I nearly succeeded with a local dealer um, who then was kicking himself a year later when she was ICC Women's Cricketer of the Year and, and then followed closely by an MBE. So I'm very aware. Oh, by the way, the car was sorted out by Martin McCaig for her. <laughs> That's another story. So what I, what I, what I wanted to talk about is the fact that, um, you know, both of you had those struggles. You then successfully put together the, uh, the contracts in 2014. Lottie was able to straddle that gap by being an ambassador for Chance to Shine, which was a, a lifeline, of course. So congratulations on getting the contracts through. So my dual question is, one, recollections of Lottie. Any any stories that you'd like to tell us that you you know that we don't know? And two, um, how hard did you have to fight to get the contracts in through in 2014? Um, yeah, sure, Noel. Um, so very, I'm very good friends with with Charlotte Edwards, um, Lottie, as as you call her, but Charlotte Edwards, if if those on the call don't know who we're talking about. Um, as you say, Noel, we started playing for England within a year of each other. Um, I started in 95, uh, Charlotte Edwards started in 96, and we played for England for 10 years together. We barely, neither of us, I barely missed a game in that time. Um, and then um, I had the honour of passing the captaincy uh, on to her when I retired, which in itself was a, was a blessing and a, something I'm very thankful for that I was able to kind of leave on my terms and um, uh, choose my retirement and, and hand the captaincy on to her. She was so ready for it. Um, so that was, uh, again, a real kind of relief for me because obviously it had been something I cherished and I wanted to be able to pass it on to, to, to her and know that she was ready. Um, we were great friends. We are great friends still. She's working full time in the women's game now. Um, she's a coach. Um, 
She'll be working on the 100. She works in Australia, um, not uh, in this last winter, but usually in a non-COVID world. She works over at the Women's Big Bash League um, and she's forged a, a brilliant career for herself post playing um, in the media as well. Um, so she, she's done really well. Um, I, I won't go into too many funny stories. I'll just share one, one quick one. It's not really a story. It's just a kind of characteristic of our friendship, really, and relationship. We, we both grew up as, as, as little girls, girls in boys' teams. You'll know that from, from, from Lottie's playing days um, uh, in, in, in her area. And, uh, um, and we were just, I think the phrase is cricket badgers, you know, completely in love with the game, complete cricket nuts. And we, we sh uh, back in the, the times when we played for England together, um, unlike, you know, as, as is the case now, we had to share rooms. You didn't have your own bedroom on tour. So, you know, we'd be away for, for several weeks at a time in this country or overseas. And Lottie would, for the bulk of, we would be roommates for, for much of those tours. Um, and one, two things characterize that, uh, that, that friendship and that uh, room sharing uh, situation. One, I'm a complete neat freak and she is the <laughs> messiest person in the world. So, um, you know, she would come in and we would come back from training or whatever and, it, and my side of the room would be absolutely pristine and she'd say, oh God, I've been burgled again um, because her, the, her side of the room was always in such a tip, or was always such a tip. Um, and then we would literally fall asleep talking about cricket and we would wake up in, as, as roommates. Um, talking about cricket, bowling changes, fielding positions. Could we have done this? Should we have done that? So uh, we, we, tired each, we tired each other out, I think, with the amount that we talked about the game. Um, but yeah, we both absolutely loved it. Um, and then the second part of your question about contracts. Yes, we introduced central contracts, as you say, for England women in 2014. Um, and also we, we announced at the same time our deal with Kia. So you talk about cars. Uh, mm -hmm. We announced that Kia were going to be the, the standalone uh, car sponsor for England women. So that was an exciting day. I can remember being at Lords with Lottie for that day. We had a Kia car under the media centre and Lottie was doing lots of media uh, interviews. And it was a special day because it signalled the start of a professional era. Um, and, you know, your sport isn't fully professional if you've only got 16 or, or so centrally contracted players you know, you've got to have more than that to call yourselves a professional sport, but it signaled the start. And um, you asked Noel whether I had to work hard to get those contracts. When it came to it, I didn't at all. The board, you know, the board were completely primed. The ECB board were primed and ready um, to, to approve the plan for central contracts for England women. Obviously, the hard work had gone on really in the years before that in getting to that point. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'd reached a kind of a tipping point where the schedule, the demands on the players, the training programs, uh, there was it was impossible for them to balance uh, part time work with playing for England. So it was, uh, as they say, it was a no brainer by then. Um, and those those contracts came came into being fairly straightforwardly uh, from there. Thanks very Thank much you. indeed, uh, Claire. Thanks, Noel. Well, a question uh, coming out of the left field now from Peter Hart. Peter. Hello Claire, thanks very much for coming this evening. My question's about ambidextrous cricketers. I mean, I remember you batted right-handed right and bowled left-arm spin. In fact, I remember when you got a hat-trick in 1999 against India, yes? And um, when I research it, I find that only 1% of, of the population are naturally amb ambidextrous. And yet we all remember lots of cricketers. I remember Clive Lloyd, you know, batted left-handed left and Bold, bold, medium pace, right, right hand. Um, so, what is it? Is it an, is it an ability you can you can learn? You can because I mean, say Mike Hussey. I read his book, and he said as a boy he batted right right handed, but his hero was Alan Border. So, when at the age of seven, he changed, turned around, and yet everything else he does in life is with his right hand, but he bats uh -huh. left hand. I mean, is it something you can? Is it natural for you, or? Was, is it a taught experience? And, you know, I've always been fascinated because every year you see somebody do it and you, but, I, but now that you're here, I'd just love to hear your experience and your thoughts on it. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, so I think I am quite ambidextrous in that I, I do anything, I suppose, 
so I write left-handed, I bowl left-handed, I would kick a, a football or a rugby ball with my left foot, but anything requiring a swing, so golf, cricket, hockey, um, tennis, weirdly tennis, one hand, if, where it's one-handed, tennis I was right-handed. So there, are, there is obviously a fairly high level of ambidexterity going on there, but not that was conscious. You know, I played all of those, played sports young, um, kicked balls, hit balls. And for some reason, I mean, I do remember when I was learning tennis um, and I was naturally right-handed, but I would switch to my left hand because I, I had a better left hand fore, forehand than a right hand backhand. Um, so I, I, could, I, I could kind of interchangeably swap. I wasn't very good at tennis, by the way, but I could, I could kind of sustain a rally by by swapping hands. I think, um, I, I mean, so no, I, it wasn't something that I learned or consciously consciously chose. What I do think, Peter, is I think that as cricketers at the highest level look to find an edge on their, on their opposition, I think you will see more and more fielders practicing eat both hands. Because if you're, if, when you're batting, I'm sure many of you will, will you know, if you're batting and you, you hit a cover drive to the left hand of cover and you know he or she is right-handed, you'll often take a single, you'll, you'll take a run. If you didn't know, if that fielder was almost equally as good with both hands, then that would give, obviously, that fielder a, a, a big advantage and would be a real asset to their, to their game. So I think... You know, I think uh, you know. I think those new, those innovations and those skills will evolve more and more as players are looking to find their edge or find an advantage. Um, I, you know, I, I suppose the the other kind of interesting thing about this is the switch hit, isn't it? If you think of the switch hit, that is essentially when 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 it's a full switch hit, that is essentially a player becoming left or right, becoming the opposite of, what's na of what they normally take, take guard as. So again, that's another innovation, isn't it, that's come in, Peterson probably being the first proponent of it. Um, you know, that's another innovation where batters can start to become more ambidextrous and open up the game by being able to hit either side of the wicket. Um, so I think sure. it's... a uh, it's a fascinating one. I couldn't do things like that as a player. And I certainly, even though I was ambidextrous in, in some ways and did some things with my left and some things with my right, I had no, I couldn't throw with my right arm. I could only throw with my left. Um, but if you, you know, if, 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 if cricketers start to become that multidimensional and that skillful, then that will take the game on yet another level, won't it? I'm just thinking when you hold the bat, I mean, do you want your strong hand at the bottom of the bat or, or not well, necessarily? I mean, I, I had my strong hand as a, as a typical left, as doing most things left-handed. I suppose my top hand, you know, my top hand was my left hand as a right-handed batter. But as I say, I had, I, I played tennis and everything else with my right. So I, I was probably, a, I, I was slightly unusual there. Um, I mean, yeah, lots of people have said, haven't they, that, right hand right right tip, uh, predominantly right-handed people they should therefore bat left-handed because it's the right hand that's doing the real you know the real delicate controlling of the bat um and that's where the control and the skill is but yeah it's a it's an interesting one fascinating question really? thank you thank you peter uh, thank you claire um, after two years uh, our next uh, question and max sawyer still hasn't learned how to change his screen name uh, it's in the name of his wife, Audrey. But Max, it's your question next. Uh, good evening, Claire. Uh, my wife is far better at IT matters than I am, so <laughs> I, I leave well alone. Um, Claire, Lords is a highly prestigious location, yet I think it is underused. What do you think about using it year round for activities, not necessarily cricketing or even sporting, which would not only be good PR for MCC, but could also be rather a nice little earner. Um, yeah, is it Max? Did you say not Max? Yeah, Max. I think um, I think it's a brilliant a brilliant question, and I would be very surprised, Max, if the MCC's commercial team are not looking at that because it's 
it, you know, it, it is so prestigious, as you say, and it could be used for so many things. You know, it's got amazing rooms, it's got amazing indoor and outdoor space. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure, well, I, I, I know from the other day, just actually, I didn't know this, but I, I learned on Friday from Mike Gatting that they have um, commercial lunches up in the home dressing room and they raise money um, by being able to put on events um, that are, you know, almost those money can't buy experiences that people will pay a lot of money for to be, you know, to be entertained or to entertain guests or clients at Lords. So I think that's that's one way um, that it that that, and I'm sure, you know, by virtue of that conversation, I'm sure it's being explored. But I think as well, it's about yes, it's about commercial activity and it's about revenue. But I think it's also about how we open it up more. I think to the community. Um, the work of the MCC Foundation, as, as, as I touched on earlier. Um, it, it's, it's about, you know, thinking, I think, and I, again, I'd be very surprised if this isn't happening, um, about, you know, thinking creatively about how it can be used and how it can, um, how it can be seen, um, to go back to the very first question, as, a, as an inclusive environment that isn't, you know, this, this place that is locked up until match day. Um, and, and even then it's very hard to access because it's expensive and you've got to be a member and and all of those things. So I think uh, I think and I'm I'm pretty sure that there are those, you know, those are those those plans and those that creative thinking is it's happening, Max. If, and if it isn't, I'm sure it will be because it's uh, such a such a wonderful space for so many things, isn't it? Whether it's the museum, whether it's the, you know, the various rooms in the pavilion, whether it's the indoor school, it's, it's got something for everyone. And that's how I think we should look at, look at it um, and make sure that we are applying that inclusive lens, trying to break down some of these sort of barriers and perceptions um, that it's only a place for a certain type of person. Mm. Thank you, Thanks, Max. Um, right, now our next question comes from member David Neil Smith, but unfortunately David is unable to join us live. He'll be watching on the recording. So I'm going to ask my uh, other co-host, Stuart Lewis, to read out David's question. Stuart. Thanks, James. It's a simple question, and I think it's a good one. David says, I'd be interested to know when an Ashes women's test will be held at Lords. That is a very good question. Um, uh, well, it, it's a very good question around the ashes, but it's it, it's an interesting question. This this comes back, I suppose, to the question. I think it was from was it from John Wilson about the conflict? You know, when I'm answering this question to you now, you know, I'm yes, here as it, it MTC. Was, Wilson, yes. was it was it uh, John? Wasn't John it? Wilson, who asked yeah. that question. So you know, this is one of those questions, I suppose, where I'm here with you as MCC president designate. But, you know, immediately I kind of jump into my ECB world, my day job as MD of women's cricket and as a member of the ECB's leadership team. Um, and I think if, you know, what I can say is that England women haven't played at Lords since that magical day on the 20, uh, on, in July 2017 when they won the World Cup. Obviously, virtually, you know, nobody played at Lords last summer, did they? So it's it's a, it is a little while um, since England women played at Lords, and, and it comes down to, it's an interesting, it's a really good question because it comes down to the kind of, and without getting too ECB about it, it, get, it, it, it comes down to this kind of growth strategy that we've got for the women's game, which is, you know, to have a World Cup final at Lords is one thing, um, to have a standard England women's match, let's say against the West Indies women or New Zealand women in a bilateral series, are we better off putting that match at Lords where we might get five or six or 7,000 people watching, or are we better off taking it to Bristol, for example, where we can fill out Bristol with five or 6,000 and create uh, a more intimate and intense atmosphere. So it's this kind of quid pro quo of, we do want to take England women's matches to the big venues. We do have an ambition to sell out Lords and the Oval and other big venues, you know, in the next few years. We, we are definitely heading in that direction. And by the way, I think the Commonwealth Games next summer 
um, all of which will be played at Edgbaston with women's cricket in the Commonwealth Games for the very first time will be a big part of that, um, that strategy um, to fill out venues. Um, so yeah, it, I, I, hopefully I'm giving some kind of answer there, which is, um, for, firstly, I do hope that we will be bringing England women to Lords very, very soon. And by that, I mean in the next couple of years. Um, but we do also have to consider you know, the, the, the atmosphere that we want to create and the ability to present on television full houses with five or 6,000 in them all of the time. And we don't always get that now um, versus playing at the big, if you like, test match stadium, which would include Lords, where five or six or 7,000 people will rattle around and won't look very good um, as a television product. So hopefully that gives an idea of some of the considerations that we have to think about. But I, I certainly think with the World Cup win, with the 100, with the Commonwealth Games, I think we're heading into a, into a, a future, a short to medium term future where we do play more games at the bigger venues, which would include Lords. Thanks, Claire. Uh, you mentioned the 100. I think Stuart's got a, a question of his own he'd like to ask you about that. Stuart. If there's time. Uh, Go ahead. Obviously, you know, some mysteries about the 100, and there are some concerns about what damage potentially it might do to other parts of the game. Um, but there's also the other side. How do you think any negative impacts can be minimised while exploiting the potential, and surely has the potential to spark real interest in cricket in the wider game? Yeah, Stuart, that's, again, putting you know my ECB hat back on here. Um, the ambition for the 100 is absolutely about a new, obviously it's a new product, it's a new format, it'll be quicker, it'll be faster, it'll hopefully be a bit simpler, and it's absolutely about reaching a new audience that we haven't yet tapped into. And actually it's the audience, when I say we haven't tapped into it, I think we did that day during the Women's World Cup final at Lords. That's the type of audience that we want coming to the 100, a family, young, diverse audience who are sampling cricket and seeing cricket almost for the first time perhaps and seeing that it is more accessible for them than perhaps other, other cricket has seemed to them. Um, so it's about kind of throwing, throwing cricket's arms around everybody. Um, and I think particularly for the women's game, um, it, it, it should be a game changer. It's big marketing investment. It's a lot of visibility. It's a lot of screen time. It's about presenting it in a more gender balanced way than we ever have with women's cricket before. It's equal prize money to the men's competition, um, equal media coverage or equal broadcast coverage. And, you know, personally, I'm excited about it. And I think we've got really high hopes for it. Uh, I can't wait to be at Lords for London Spirit Games. Um, and yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, lots of people were ready to write off T20 cricket back in, the early noughties, 2003, I think, when it first came into the domestic game and, and look where that is now. So I think let's give it a go and, and certainly back it um, and see what it can do for the future of the game in terms of reaching new people, new audiences, new fans. Thanks, Stuart. Well, one last question then. Um, uh, Derek, we, we, he, you heard from him for the first question. Derek, your question again, please. Thank you. Thank you, James. And thank you, Claire. Uh, just a quickie for Audrey there in uh, Stanford. Um, my youngest daughter had a wedding reception in the long room. And I, we don't realise how important this is to other people because one of the guests, one of her female friends came up and said, I've just told my father I'm in a place called the long room and he can't believe I'm that lucky. So there you go. Um, Claire, with the name Rachel Hayhoe Flynn has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, if she'd lived, she may have edged you as the first female president. She absolutely should have done, that's um, for sure. The question I ask is, there's a, a portrait of Rachel in the pavilion, but I think many cricket fans believe that we should actually have a more substantial commemoration of her. Would you agree with that? And what would you look at doing at Lords? Yes, I would, Derek, 100% agree with that. And it's something I've already expressed some opinions on um, and talked to you know certain committee members about I, th I don't think we've done enough to commemorate Rachel's impact yet on the game. Um, 
she you know we we use the word word pioneer very kind of loosely sometimes um you know she made sure that the first ever world cup men's or women's before she, the women's world cup two years before the men's world cup she set that up she pioneered so much for what the game is now laid such important foundations for where the women's game is now and i don't think personally that we have commemorated that as meaningfully as perhaps we should and so I do think um, that I do think a statue um, of Rachel would be um, appropriate and and fitting and you know there was an article on International Women's Day on March the 8th uh, the SCG uh, the Sydney Cricket Ground uh, announcing their first uh, statue of a female cricketer they've got 73 statues of male cricketers in Australia and none of women. And that's the same in this country. We've got, I don't know the number of men's, men's statues, cricket statues in this country. In Australia, it was 73 before they introduced their first female. So unfortunately, Australia have beaten us to it. There are none around the world. Um, and I think it's that visibility and that representation of women um, in the game is so important. And so, uh, I, I would really like to see that happen um, uh, in the not too distant future, Derek. I mean, I'd, I'd name one of the gates. We've got a North Gate and an East Gate. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a Rachel Hayho Flint gate. I mean, Look, you're, you're, you're spot on. And whether it, you know, it, whether it is a statue, I know statues are very kind of topical at the moment, aren't they, after the last 12 months? Um, so, so that's, you know, that's, that's been in my head as, as one way, but you're right, it, it, you know, it could be, it could be part of the ground, it could be something symbolic, it could be, it could be something to do with scholarships, it could be something to do with the way the game does become more inclusive. Her name is such a powerful name and a name that we should all make sure the game remembers for as long as possible, and particularly, um, you know, to mark what she's done um, in accelerating the progress for, for women in the game. Thank you so much. Well, what a wonderful evening. On behalf of all of us here tonight, Claire, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks also to those of you who have asked the questions and all who have been able to join us tonight. <coughs> now, as usual, I'm going to ask John Fingle to say a few closing remarks and to let you know of the two very exciting future events we have coming up over the next couple of weeks. When he is finished, Please would you all unmute your audio so we can give Claire a well-deserved warm round of applause. Fingers. Thank you very much again, James. And um, damn you, Derek, you just took the words out of my mouth. When Rachel, who was a dear friend of mine, died, I suggested immediately that we should have either the North Gate or the East Gate, named as the Rachel Hayhoe Flint Gate. You come in through the Grace Gate, why shouldn't you go in through the Hayhoe Flint Gate? So I, I think that'll be much better than the statue, which is, as you say, controversial. But that's beside the point. Um, I think that was a wonderful tour de raison. It was a fantastic evening. You answered every question very honestly and very candidly and very interestingly. And I've got to say, I think any parents who have the prescience to name their child as a cricket club, CC, I think you know, have got a lot of um, lot, lot to be said for them. And um, the only question I was, wasn't sure if it was going to be asked was whether you'd had any conversation with Robin Marler, one of your predecessors as president, who didn't have a lot to say about women playing cricket with men, and I wondered what he might have thought about a woman president of MCC. So with that aside, it has been fantastic. We all wish you a wonderful presidential year, and on behalf of us all and me, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, here. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, and Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see. You, we'll see you next week. Thanks all for joining us, and uh, I'll send you details of who our next two guests are. <laughs> I meant to tell you. I forgot to John, tell you. I always forget. Do you want to come in, John? I think I meant to tell you what's coming up. Yes, next. Yeah. Um, You're getting next Monday. We've got the Charlie Sale, but with that sort of slightly off off track. <laughs> and then Monday, the seventeenth of May, Mike Brearley is our penultimate guest of the season, who's had his seventy ninth birthday last week. And to end the season on the 28th of May, the one and only Mikey Holding is going to be gracing us with his presence. So we'll so see you all next week. Thanks all for thanks all for joining us, and we'll see you again very soon. Goodbye, everybody. Stay oh, safe no. and well. Bye. Bye. Bye.